The Bill and Kelly Show is recorded at Studio A at Executive Suite Squared in beautiful Hammond, Indiana. Now, here's Bill and Kelly. Uh, welcome to The Bill and Kelly Show. Uh, today, our guest is Hector Colon, and Hector serves as the President and CEO of the Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. Prior to that, he spent six years as the Executive Director of the Department of Health and Human Services of Milwaukee County. Klon is a member of the U.S. National Boxing Team for seven years. He won seven national titles and competed in the 1992 Olympic Trials, losing to Jesse, uh, Jesse Bersino, uh, whom not whom he knocked out in the first round of the U.S. Welterweight Championship in 1993. Clone serving and mixed martial arts commissioner for the state of Wisconsin from 2009 to 2011. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in occupational therapy from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Hector, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Bill. So happy to be here with you as well. Oh, we're very happy you're with us. And, and uh, Kelly uh, passes along her regards. She could not be with us today because of business she had planned. Um, but why don't we start out talking about your life, um, where you came from, where your parents came from, uh, how you grew up, the uh, environment you were in when you grew up, and, and uh, we'll just get through your life story, uh, your boxing career, and uh, then what you're doing now. Yes, thank you, thank you. So my roots are from Puerto Rico. Uh, both of my parents uh, were born from Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was born in Milwaukee, and so I, I've been uh, in Milwaukee all my life. And uh, when I was 12 years old, my mother and father got a divorce and my father moved back to Puerto Rico. So my mother is still uh, in Milwaukee and my father now is in Puerto Rico. Um, our neighborhood was on the near south side of Milwaukee. And at the time when my parents first married and, and first lived there, we were only one of about three Latino families on the entire block. And uh, so it's a very different neighborhood today. Right now, I'd say it's about over 90% uh, Latino families. Uh, but back then, uh, there was um, an individual in the community that did not want us there. And uh, he was bullying me and calling me a spick and, and some other bad names, the N-word, and, and really wanted us out of his neighborhood. And I recall one time going to him, you know, on a summer day, wanting to play baseball. And, and he hit me in the face and I came home with a bloody nose. And, and um, I, my father was really worried and asked me what happened. He said, ¿Qué te pasó? What happened? And I told him what happened. And it was on that day that he said he wanted to take me to the boxing gym uh, so that I can learn how to box. And that's what started uh, my boxing career. Uh, amazing. And what age was that again? Uh, so I was nine years old at the time. Uh -huh. And I recall going to the gym and really not being interested. There was a lot, lot of big guys there and and I uh, really wasn't interested. I really liked baseball because that was a sport my father was good at and I, I was good at. And, but uh, my, my boxing coach, uh, who we called Shorty, uh, who is really a giant, uh, he has really been a giant in my life and really helped to create the champion that I am today, both in and out of the ring. And I remember him telling my father, he said, your son is natural. Uh, he's going to become a champion. And that, that struck me that he had that level of confidence in me and really helped me uh, in my life. And uh, very proud that I had uh, this experience with that bully. Um, if it wasn't for that bully, uh, who knows where I, where I would be? I probably would have never have boxed. And boxing helped uh, me out so much in my life and uh, really is a main factor of why I am the person that I am today. Amazing, and that, you know, uh, for those of us who've known people or uh, been uh, fighting in, uh, whether it be boxing or UFC, the dedication there is um, just off the charts. I, it just the physical demands of, of training, 
um, because you have to go through the different rounds, so your endurance training and so on. And that uh, probably speaks to a lot of uh, TQ um, to come o overcome adversity and to kind of stick with it, if you will. Absolutely. Boxing really taught me five, five virtues. That's really the essence uh, of my noodle to release book, my journey from boxing ring to boardroom, five virtues for life and leadership. And the virtues are first magnanimity. And that's, that's really about striving for greatness. Uh, when you're a boxer, you don't want to be number two. You do not want to not be the champion. You're striving to become the champion. You're striving to be the best you possibly can be. Nothing but number one is good enough. And so you learn that virtue uh, in boxing, but then you work extremely hard. The dedication, determination, and discipline to get you to that status is something that that work ethic that you learn in boxing. The next virtue is humility. Humility is about, in this context, is about uh, serving others. And so I learned what it meant like to be served. So I'm in the boxing ring, I'm winning championships, and my coach is on the side smiling, uh, not getting any of the glory, uh, but he's just so proud uh, that I'm up there and I'm the champion. And I also learned that even though it's a one-on-one -on -one sport, um, you still have a team. You have sparring partners. You have people that encourage you. You obviously have a coach. Uh, so real, I really learned uh, what it meant to be a servant leader uh, through my coach, uh, Israel Acosta Shorty, which I think is a giant. Uh, and then perseverance. You learn how to persevere. And, you know, I lost my first fight. I was crying. I wanted to give up. And then I lost my second fight, and I remember really wanting to give up. First, there's this, this, there's this, this intense fear you feel that as you're getting into the ring, and then you lose, and you're embarrassed, and then you start crying. Uh, there's nothing fun about that. Uh, but I remember my coach saying, stick with it. You're, you're, you're a champ. You can become a champion. Don't give up. Uh, the next virtue is courage. There is no greater courage than one would have in face in going into that ring. I don't care who you are, Muhammad Ali, uh, Floyd Mayweather, Oscar De La Hoya, some of the greats to have ever graced the ring, they go into that ring with fear. But they go into that ring prepared, and that's what gives them confidence. Uh, so that, that virtue of courage was really big that I learned in boxing. And the last virtue is temperance. Temperance is about self-control and restraint and when you get hit you don't just start fighting back you have to compose yourself and think and re-strategize and how am I going am I going to throw a jab how do I not get hit the next time and so all of those virtues um, that I learned in boxing have been really applicable to my life and have helped me strive from the boxing ring to the boardroom. Yeah, that is amazing and um, so let's talk about a bit more about your boxing career because um, uh, you were um, you were boxing on the Olympic team for a period of seven years, right? And so um, talk about that. How many titles did you hold during that period of time? Yeah, I had seven titles. Uh, just one minor correction in the beginning of when you introduced me, there were seven titles in 10 years of boxing. Ah, okay. And I was on the U.S. national boxing team from uh, the age of 14 uh, until I was 20. So six years, I was on the U.S. national boxing team. Mm -hmm. And through that experience, I got to travel all over the world uh, representing the United States of America. And it was a true honor. I learned so much um, about, um, you know, other cultures through that experience. I, I grew in... Um, as a great boxer through those experiences. I got to meet some wonderful people, boxers from all across the world uh, and people from the United States that were part of my team uh, that we still keep in contact to this day. Um, it's really, those are brothers for life and we've been through so much together and we've helped each other and uh, we really love each other. So my boxing experience has been amazing. Now, we carry on from that. Of course, you go into college. Uh, you went to U of M um, Milwaukee, or U of W Milwaukee. Apologize. I know 
we probably have some people tuning out right around now when I mention U of M. <laughs> so, um, so describe that experience, um, uh, you know, going from boxing to college and what made you pick the area that you went in, occupational therapy? Did you feel bad for the people that you knocked out during your boxing career and uh, you thought by becoming occupational therapist, you could bring them back to health? Yeah. So you know, I will share with you actually. Um, I, so when I lost in Olympic trials, so so here I was. I was 19 years old. I was favored to go to the Olympics as a welterweight. Um, I had beaten uh, Vernon Forrest, uh, who was a four-time uh, four-time world champion. I beat him twice. Uh, I TKO'd Jose Antonio Rivera, uh, who also became a three-time world champion. And here I am on the rise to the Olympic trials and hoping I would make the Olympics. Uh, and I was favored to go in my weight class and, um, and I lost. And it was, it was, uh, it was, I was hurting uh, because I had all these hopes and dreams. Um, I wasn't only hurting because of the loss. I was also hurting because I wasn't focused. The biggest opportunity of my life at that time I was distracted by some unproductive relationships and I was looking past the Olympics. I was looking at the gold medal already. I was looking at the lucrative contract and the millions I was going to make. And the most important opportunity right in front of me, I wasn't focused. So I lost and, and it was devastating. I didn't, the big time promoters, I wasn't hearing from them and uh, I was searching and I, and I found God on December 27, 1992, I bought my first Bible and gave my life to Christ. Uh, six months later, I fight Jesse Brasino again. Uh, this time I knock him out in the first round for the U.S. Championship. Uh, that fight was on cable television. Uh, it was on the front cover of USA Boxing Magazine and on the inside cover of Sports Illustrated. Promoters came back uh, and started offering me some contracts, but I put it through a year of prayer and discernment and ended up feeling a strong calling away from the sport. It was the hardest decision I ever made in my life. I believe I could have been very successful, could have won a world title. Uh, I think made millions, just like some of the others that I competed with, but I gave it all away. But that same dedication, determination, and discipline, it took me to be a champion boxer, is that same dedication, determination, and discipline I apply it in my life and really striving for excellence in everything that I do, whether it be as a husband, as a father, uh, as a professional and CEO, I'm really striving to give it all, give it my all and, and be the best. So when I gave that all up, I said, I got to go back to school. Uh, I was 20 years old. And so I, I didn't go to school right away. Um, but then I, I always was interested in like sports medicine and athletics and and uh, learned a little bit about, first I was gonna go for physical therapy. And then I learned about occupational therapy and ended up doing that. And um, you know, it was a little hard for me in the beginning. I remember taking my entrance exam and scoring really low and taking ba basic arithmetic courses and, and feeling a little embarrassed about that. Um, and then uh, my next semester, I remember telling the, the counselor, I said, these classes are too easy. I want to take regular classes. And at first, she didn't want to let me, but then I was somehow able to convince her and I, I was able to take regular courses. And I graduated with honors. Uh, I have, a, I got a 3.83 uh, for my master's degree. I was the only student in my entire class to publish my thesis in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy. I worked hard. I'm a fighter. And so it wasn't easy. But um, uh, again, that dedication, determination, and discipline I learned in boxing, I put that all in and, and worked really hard to uh, eventually get my degree. Oh, it's amazing. Amazing. And uh, I just want to let our viewers and listeners know because you and I talked prior to the show, uh, I, I knew many occupational and, and physical therapists. One thing in comparing and also knew a lot of doctors, um, occupational therapy is not an easy program to get through. It, it is very accelerated. In a lot of cases, it's a five-year program. Um, and then to practice uh, nowadays, 
uh, you have to have a master's to actually practice. Um, and so that, again, hats off to you. Is, uh, the friends I know that um, have um, uh, gone through that program, it just, it's rigorous. And a lot of them, a lot of information in a very short period of time, um, comparatively, uh, compared to other programs. So uh, that is amazing. So from there, you practice as an occupational therapist? Yeah, for a short time. I started off, uh, my, my goal was I wanted to work in a hospital system, gain some experience, and then have my own business. I wanted to contract with hospital systems and other providers to provide services specifically uh, to Latino, Spanish-speaking clients. Uh, so that I envisioned that being my niche. Uh, and the value I could bring uh, to the market. But what happened was the job market was saturated. And so those hospital opportunities weren't available uh, during that time. And so um, with, with occupational therapy, you can do hospital, you can do outpatient, you can do mental health, you can do geriatrics, you can do pediatrics. There's lots of opportunities. And so I was always interested in mental health. Um, I have a sister. Uh, who has uh, bipolar disorder. And so for many years, I saw my sister in and out of jail, uh, attempted suicides and really struggle uh, with, her, with her illness. And so I always had a personal passion uh, for that. And, and so I ended up getting my first job as a mental health clinician, working in a community support program for people with mental illness we were getting individuals that were coming out of jail and helping them reintegrate back into the community. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, and then within three months, I actually became the assistant director of that program. And I had the opportunity to make lots of great changes uh, to really help integrate these individuals back in our society, get them back to school, get them in, get them in a job. And uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I did that for uh, three years. And then from there, I went to the United Community Center, which is where I started boxing and played baseball and went there as a kid since I was nine years old. So it was awesome uh, that I was able to go back as their associate executive director. And there I oversaw their elderly programs. And so it was wonderful to be in a place that helped create who I am uh, give back and, uh, and it, advance in my career as well. Oh, amazing. And so uh, now there's a transformation that you now started be uh, taking the next step up. Um, and, uh, and I see that you were at one time uh, the executive director of the Department of Health and Human Services for Milwaukee. Yeah. So what got you there? Oh, that was a great, great experience. Uh, so I worked uh, um, with Governor Doyle in the state of Wisconsin prior to that in various leadership capacities and individuals from the Doyle administration um, recommended me to the county executive, Chris Abley, uh, for that director job, which was the largest department in county government. And it's one of the most challenging departments uh, to oversee. And I was honored and privileged uh, when I got the call to uh, interview for the process uh, or go through the interview process. Uh, and once I was selected uh, to lead that organization, I was extremely humbled uh, and honored. And I would have to say that anybody that wants to have uh, developed their leadership skills should work in government uh, in a department like Health and Human Services. You will grow in humility uh, you will grow in leadership uh, in those roles. So it was a fascinating uh, opportunity for me. I was there for six years. And in my six years, I outlived the last or the previous six directors combined. Uh, it is a thankless job. It's a very tough job. Um, and it's, you know, underpaid and compared to what you can get in the market uh, for other opportunities. But uh, I loved it. Uh, I loved working with uh, County Executive Chris Abley. I loved the transformation that um, we uh, went through while I was there with my team, incredible staff that were at the Department of Health and Human Services. We turned multi-million dollar uh, uh, deficits into multi-million dollar surpluses. 
Sorry about that. All no right. problem. So while at the county, we turn multi-million dollar deficits uh, into multi-million dollar surpluses. Uh, we change our service delivery models for individuals with um, uh, that had mental health issues, moving more towards a community-based uh, system of care. We um, we uh, we ended a long-term care institution that was there while I was there. One of the hardest things. Uh, I've ever done in my career because there was lots of opposition, but it was the right thing to do. We saved the county lots of money. We provided better outcomes for the individuals that we serve. We allowed them to, the dignity to learn, live in the community close to their loved ones and families. And we did it all in accordance with the law. So that was a, a just a tremendous experience. I, I really loved uh, that experience. And, and again, it helped me grow in humility and in leadership, which helped prepare me for that next opportunity. Which is eventually the president and CEO of Lutheran Social Services. Yes. And what, what uh, so my, I had to get confirmed three times when I was the director of health and human services. And during the last time, um, there were some county supervisors that were threatening not to confirm me because they were really upset uh, with, with my boss, Chris Abley, for a couple of reasons. But one, he gave me a $50,000 raise and that's kind of unheard of in government, uh, but he did it because of results. Uh, he did it because the market indicated that, that I should be at that level. Uh, and he did it for retention. But when that happened, the county board there was a state law that was reducing their pay by 50% and took away all their benefits. So it was like a war and, and they were telling me, our only way to get back to Chris Abley is to not confirm you. And uh, I was like, man, I'm the angel you know versus the devil you may get, you know? So I, I, you know, I tried to convince them and I was able to turn some around, but they were threatening not to confirm me. And during that process, there was this whole organic um, stand with Hector campaign that started. And I was so humbled and honored. There were Republicans and Democrats and labor and business and uh, people from all walks of life from all across the country uh, started this campaign and were pressuring the county supervisors to do the right thing. Uh, I ended up getting confirmed. Um, um, and instead of a four-year contract, they, they try to negotiate it down to a two-year. Within three weeks, I get a call from the chairman of the board of Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin, Upper Michigan. And I thought it was great timing that to have a conversation. He said, look, everywhere I turn, people mention that I need to speak with you. I have this position available. Would you be interested? And so we had a glass of wine and uh, we were supposed to meet an hour, but we met for two. And he tells me now that um, he went home to his wife and he said, if LSS were my company, I would hire Hector Colon on the spot. But it wasn't his company. And we went through a six month process uh, in order to eventually become the president and CEO at Lutheran Social Services. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an amazing path. And which brings you to share this story with others uh, in your new book. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit about that and uh, tell us, you know, basically w when you hope it will be released and uh, tell us what brought you to decide to become an author. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think uh, I'll start off with the reasons why um, I wrote the book. One, I wanted to really inspire individuals that uh, had similar challenges to mine. If you read my book, you'll see that I have an A score of six. A stands for adverse early childhood trauma. And with an A score of six, the research would indicate that I would have a thousand, 200% likelihood of, have, of being depressed. 
and a 200% likelihood of committing suicide. So I hope to inspire those individuals that had similar challenges to mine to give them hope that it is possible to succeed in the midst of those challenges. I also wrote the book because for leaders, leaders that are looking for a different way of leading. Uh, you'll see in my book there, I talk about virtues and values and, and servant leadership. Uh, and I believe that virtues, values, and servant leadership really hold the keys uh, to transformational results and long-term success. So I hope to provide an inspiration to them. And lastly, I hope that I'll be able to connect with individuals that I would never have had that opportunity if it wasn't for this book. And hopefully be able to connect individuals to Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan, the organization that I serve and love. And I'll give you a few examples of individuals that I have met. Um, one is Arthur Brooks, who used to be the president and CEO of the American Enterprise Institute, and now he's at Harvard. But this guy wrote several best-selling books. He gave me an glowing endorsement for my book. Uh, and I look to develop a stronger relationship with him. Howard Behar, the former president of Starbucks, took Starbucks to a global company. He wrote me a glowing endorsement for my book. I got the opportunity to meet him. Craig Culver, the co-founder of Culver's Restaurant, glowing endorsement. So these are individuals I would have never met likely if it wasn't for writing this book, and I now have had the privilege uh, to meet them. So that's a little bit about why uh, I wrote the book. Amazing. So uh, just reviewing your life story, as a child, you overcame the adversity of uh, experiencing prejudice. You overcame uh, physical adversity when you experienced your first loss. You used all this as a fuel to get you through your education, and to where you are now. Uh, just a phenomenal story. And uh, we can't wait to read the book. Uh, and you are having an online event uh, coming up pretty soon? Yes, uh, August 27th uh, through Boswell Books. Um, and um, we don't, uh, so it's gonna be, there'll be more information. I wanna provide my website uh, is Hector Colon, M K E dot com. Um, so if you go to the website, uh, you'll be able to purchase the book there, but also have updates uh, re regarding uh, our launch, uh, which would be August 27th. So we're in the development stages of, of, of putting that uh, together. But, but, th but through this book, I hope to inspire and, and change lives. So I, I shared a little bit about the why, uh, but a little bit more about the book. Uh, the framework of the book is really on those virtues magnanimity, where um, it's really about striving for greatness. So I encourage uh, everybody that reads the book to what is their, what is their talents? Uh, what is the gift that God has given them? And how could they pursue that with dedication, determination, and discipline to be the best they possibly can be in that area? And then humility. Uh, I strongly encourage individuals to uh, serve others. Uh, the more you serve others, the more you will get back. Uh, and it's a great feeling when you know you're making a difference in the lives of others. I also uh, will encourage them to face their fears and do the right thing even when it's hard. That's courage. And, um, and there's a great feeling when you're able to move forward with something that's really hard. And so that's courage. And then perseverance. I'm going to encourage the reader to fail. If you're not failing, you're taking and uh, you're not stretching yourself as much as you could. And uh, by failing, you're going to learn very important life lessons that could really take you to that next level. And I'm going to encourage the reader to exhibit temperance and self-control and restraint, even when there's situations that uh, you can't control that is out of your control or when you're, 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 um, you know, you're tested. Um, and so you, you exhibit that temperance, that self-control. So those are kind of the, the virtues that are really the framework of my book. And I throw in lots of personal stories of struggle, uh, as my childhood, 
uh, through school, uh, through boxing, um, all of these different areas, lots of struggle in my life and how I was able to overcome that. Amazing. Well, we can't wait to get a hold of the book when it's available. Uh, it's an amazing story. I'm just uh, very honored that you were able to get on our show today and uh, we'll get this uploaded. Um, and like I said, it will be dropping here within a day. Um, is there anything else you want to share with our viewers and listeners? Yeah, I just want to say uh, I hope uh, you read the book and I hope it uh, changes lives, it changes your life. Uh, and I want you to do me a favor. Um, if the book uh, inspires you um, to do more good in our society, please share that with me. Uh, but also please share your stories, you know, the difference that you're making in the world. If we all did that, um, we can make our world a better place to live, work, and play. And now that's needed now more than ever. We're, our society is so politically polarized and we have the civil unrest going on in, in all across the nation and we need values and virtues and, and good people that want to make a difference in the world, but also share their stories. The fact of the matter is that the overwhelming majority of people in our world are great people, um, but we don't hear their stories because sometimes they're not publicized or sometimes they're not written. Uh, so I wanted to write my story. I hope uh, it'll inspire others, and uh, and I hope to change the world along with you. That's that's wonderful, boy. I tell you, I um, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers are as well. Uh, just a question or two before we let you go. Uh, do you what do you do as far as boxing anymore? Do you just do you get in the ring at all, or? Do you want to get in the ring? Do you want to hit somebody? <laughs> Every once in a while. I, but these days I'm more bobbing and weaving and rolling with the punches than I am hitting. But uh, I enjoy working out. Um, so I, I, I don't really get in the ring, but uh, I work out every morning, 4.45 every morning, get up, try to start the day right, uh, get my exercise in, my, my prayers in, my spiritual reading in. Uh, to really start the day right. And it's kind of takes me back to the boxing days. That's what I did back then. Uh, so I try to do that, try to stay in shape, but uh, no more boxing, just bobbing and weaving now. <laughs> Even though you want to hit somebody at some point, you, you're controlled enough to where that doesn't happen. Sometimes, but that's where the virtue of temperance comes in. <laughs> amen, amen to that. And in this day and age, you need a little plenty of temperance. The world is unsettled right now. Uh, Hector, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on. We're very honored. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. We'll make sure all the information about how people can get to your website is part of the show post. And uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you so much. God bless you. Love you. And uh, your, your listeners, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this show. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Have a wonderful day, folks, and please be safe. And please remember to be kind to your neighbors. We'll say goodbye for now. Thank you. Take care. This episode of The Bill and Callie Show is brought to you by Executive Suite Squared by ATG offering private and shared office space with 24-7 secured access, three state-of-the-art conference rooms, shared lounge and cafe area, receptionist, printing center, and fiber optic internet access with Wi-Fi throughout. Conveniently located just south of 8094 at the Kennedy Avenue exit at 2901 Carlson Drive in Hammond, Indiana. For information on how you can become a member, Go to executivesuites2.com or call 219-844-2901. Executive Suites Squared, home to the Bill and Callie Show.